Bonjour à tous et à toutes. En tant que doyen de cette faculté d'architecture, la Cambre Horta de l'ULB, je vous souhaite évidemment chaleureusement la bienvenue. Bienvenue à cette rencontre, rencontre avant tout avec Kirsten Geertz et le monde d'office. Évidemment, c'est pour ça que la plupart d'entre vous êtes là, mais aussi, je dirais, rencontre quand même avec notre faculté. En effet, si nous sommes réunis ce soir en ce régime semi-présentiel et distanciel, c'est aussi pour marquer l'entrée dans cette nouvelle année académique 2020. On veut mettre un peu de forme, mais pas trop. Vous avez remarqué, par exemple, on n'a pas de toge, comme on le fait dans certaines autres facultés. Mais donc, on voulait que ce ne soit pas strictement et seulement la conférence de Kirsten, mais aussi, on voulait à cette occasion annoncer des éléments et des événements importants pour la vie de la faculté. D'abord, le prix du mémoire. Je vais quand même peut-être passer à la fiche de la conférence. Et puis, vous aurez donc l'annonce du prix du mémoire de la faculté. C'est Eric Vanech, Eric est là qui est notre coordinateur des mémoires de fin d'études et euh, ex vice doyen à l'enseignement qui fera cette présentation. Nous dévoilerons aussi le lauréat du prix du projet d'architecture, et ça c'est la présidente du jury euh, Aurélie Haché qui euh, officiera. Nous rendrons aussi, euh, un peu vite mais on voulait marquer le coup, on rendra aussi hommage à deux enseignants qui quittent. Ça marche pas Alors on voit, on me voit moi. Alors attendez, ce n'était pas le but. On va retourner sur le live event et on va choisir de partager ça par exemple. Est-ce que c'est mieux si je prends ça, que je diffuse en direct Ça devrait être bon comme ça Pas encore très grave à ce stade, mais il faut qu'on règle les choses. C'est bon Si quelqu'un est de nouveau connecté ou voit Teams, le live event, est-ce que tu peux me confirmer qu'on voit bien On voit toujours On me voit moi toujours Alors, diffuser en direct, euh, tout, tout, on va faire ça comme ça. Tu me dis C'est bon Top. Donc on voudrait quand même à cette occasion d'une rentrée académique souligner, c'est un peu paradoxal, mais le départ de deux enseignants de la faculté, Guy Adam et Georges Pierson. Et puis je vous adresserai quand même un petit mot en cette rentrée euh, très particulière et je vais me risquer à une petite présentation de Kirsten, mais euh, pas longue. On aura évidemment pour l'essentiel le plaisir de l'écouter lui et euh, tout ça doit se faire dans un timing assez serré. On doit quitter les lieux, je dirais, à 22h. Donc, on ne sait pas encore s'il y aura du temps pour des questions-réponses, mais voilà, tel est le programme. Eric, je pense que c'est à toi que je passe la parole pour nous parler du prix du mémoire de la faculté. Merci, Pablo, avec plaisir. Voilà, bonsoir à tous, merci d'être là, bonsoir à ceux qui nous suivent en, en diffusion. Euh, effectivement, euh, chaque année, on organise le prix du mémoire de la faculté d'architecture. C'est un moment assez important pour les, les étudiants qui ont donc été proclamés il y a quelques jours sur la grande place de Bruxelles, mais qui, euh, ce soir, sont concernés par euh, l'attribution d'un prix euh, pour le, le mémoire de fin d'étude le, le plus euh, remarquable selon un jury. Alors, La, la première chose à annoncer, c'est que nous avons un, un étudiant qui est hors concours, tellement le mémoire qui a été déposé sortait de l'ordinaire. Il s'agit de Thomas Grec. Thomas Grec a rentré non pas un mémoire, mais non pas deux mémoires, mais trois mémoires, qui chacun font à peu près 300 pages et euh, qui vont euh, donc explorer le thème des architectures néo-gothiques des édifices profanes en Wallonie, vraiment dans euh, un détail et une finesse d'analyse qui force le respect. Au point que nous avons demandé que le décanat attribue à cet étudiant un prix spécial hors concours. Et donc, avant de proclamer le prix du mémoire classique, mais tout aussi prestigieux, je voudrais appeler Thomas Grec s'il est là pour qu'il puisse recevoir un prix spécial et toutes les félicitations évidemment du décanat et de la faculté. Alors, 
Alors, le prix, c'est un trophée et des cadeaux et un chèque. Est-ce que Thomas vous dit quelque chose euh, Oui, avec plaisir. Euh, ben, bonsoir déjà. Euh, c'est vraiment un, un plaisir et un honneur de recevoir euh, ce prix, surtout pour un thème a priori, euh, et pour ceux qui ont fait les cinq années d'architecture avec moi, est assez peu diffusé et assez peu abordé euh, pendant les études. Et c'est ça que j'ai trouvé intéressant aussi, c'était de pouvoir travailler sur un sujet peu étudié, peu valorisé et qui mérite, euh, si vous avez l'occasion de vous partir les, les 800 pages, qui mérite vraiment de, de s'intéresser. Donc euh, voilà. C'est un sujet très personnel et aussi particulièrement intéressant auquel je vous invite à vous inviter quand vous payez un bâtiment néoclétique. Merci. Merci. Et bravo. Alors, derrière un étudiant, il y a aussi un enseignant. Donc, je voudrais attirer votre attention aussi sur le fait que ce type d'études sont supervisées par un promoteur de mémoire. Et dans ce cas-ci, il s'agit de notre collègue Marianne Putman. Je suis passé devant la salle. En tout cas, bravo Marianne. On va accompagner ce travail. Les félicitations te reviennent autant qu'à Thomas. Voilà, c'était donc le prix spécial du mémoire de la faculté d'architecture de la Cour Montréal. Alors, pour le prix, il y a un préjury, parce qu'en réalité, euh, les, mé les mémoires qui ont obtenu au moins 80% sont automatiquement, euh, à condition de recevoir l'accord des promoteurs et des mémorants, euh, mis en lice pour le prix. Euh, évidemment, il faut euh, faire déjà une présélection pour euh, le, que le jury final puisse travailler de façon approfondie. Et donc, sur les 40 mémoires, euh, on, on nous demande d'en retenir 6. Et ce travail, qui est important, a été réalisé cette année par quatre membres internes à la faculté, qui est la composition habituelle de notre préjury. Je remercie infiniment ces collègues d'avoir pris le temps de travailler à cette sélection. Il s'agit de Ludivine Damet, Carlo Menon, Denis Paul, et Anna Povoas. Merci à eux. Alors ensuite, on passe au jury, donc il y a un second tour, si vous voulez, une finale pour les six mémoires présélectionnées et ceux-là sont lus en détail par les membres du jury de manière à organiser ce matin d'ailleurs un jury approfondi sur la qualité et de ces différents mémoires afin d'en sélectionner un pour le prix. Alors les trois membres internes à la faculté étaient Géry Leloutre, Grégory Levkovitch et Marianne Putman, ce que je remercie beaucoup d'avoir effectué cette mission avec brio, c'était un plaisir de réunir ces membres du jury ce matin. Et trois membres externes à la faculté, nous avions Christine Fontaine de Hulouvin Loki, Pierre Loas de l'ENSA Vlacambre et jean Veil de l'école de Marne-la-Vallée Paris-Est. Voilà, merci à ces six membres du jury qui effectivement ont travaillé dur ce matin avec moi. Alors, quelles sont les six mémoires qui ont été présélectionnées Ce sont donc les finalistes. Alors, le mémoire de Yasmine Alaouzi sur la maison Riffen. Le mémoire de Julia Barnoin sur euh, l'architecture origamique. Le mémoire de Gwenola Bayon de Noyer sur le campus de Charleroi. Le mémoire de Maïté Deschamps sur le patrimoine industriel des espaces pour la transition, le mémoire de Juliette Mourad El Khoury pour euh, l'autoroute sectaire entre Beyrouth et Tripoli, et le mémoire de Mikhail Pop sur la poésie in architecture, mémoire rédigée en anglais. Alors, une mention a été accordée par le jury à Gwenola Bayon de Noyer pour son mémoire sur le campus de Charleroi, une analyse approfondie de l'évolution historique de la ville, donc d'un point de vue urbanistique, et de l'évolution du campus de cette ville, et enfin une série de scénarios possibles pour le futur d'évolution de ce campus, le tout croisé avec des exemples euh, internationaux de campus. Je ne sais pas si Gwenola Bayon de Noyer est dans la salle. En tout cas, voilà, elle peut me rejoindre ici. Voilà, venez, je vous félicite, je vous remets le, le paquet cadeau lié à la mention. Bravo pour avoir été jusque dans les finalistes et de recevoir même une mention de la part du jury qui a fort apprécié votre travail. Si vous voulez dire un mot, mettez-vous devant l'ordinateur. Euh, 
Bah, merci beaucoup. Bah, je voudrais surtout remercier euh, Benoît Moritz, euh, que j'ai vu arriver, et Gérald Dinakas, je ne sais pas si c'est Mais euh, voilà, bah, c'est un plaisir de travailler sur Charleroi et de s'intéresser à cette ville. Euh, voilà. <rire> Et de fait, félicitations aux deux promoteurs, Benoît Moritz et Géraldine Lacasse de notre faculté. Bravo. Alors, deuxième information que je voulais vous donner, et le suspense monte, nous avons une deuxième mention. Une mention attribuée à Michael Pop pour un mémoire sur l'esthétique visuelle, les visual studies en architecture et singulièrement par rapport aux techniques de, de création de l'école architecturale suisse. Je, je résume un mémoire extrêmement dense qui mêle analyse d'architecture, biographie des architectes, théorie philosophique de rapport à l'image. Je ne sais pas si Michael est dans la salle. Je l'invite à me rejoindre. Je la tire devant, je la tire devant. Là. Voilà, Michael, bravo pour ce mémoire qui a beaucoup été apprécié par les membres du jury, un mémoire maîtrisé de bout en bout et qui, qui mêle, je dirais, une, une capacité théorique à une capacité d'analyse de terrain et des travaux des architectes tout à fait singulière. Félicitations. Merci. Et voilà, je voudrais remercier spécialement euh, mon promoteur Walter de m'avoir suivi et, et de euh, <coughs> cette recherche. Et aussi à différentes personnes que j'ai rencontrées à travers les études qui m'ont permis vraiment de nourrir mes recherches et mes réflexions sur ce sujet. Donc, voilà, merci. Bravo, bravo. Et donc, on est bravo à Walter Van Acker qui était le promoteur de ce mémoire. Bien. Alors, je, je n'ai plus de mention dans ma poche, le règlement nous autorise à accorder deux mentions. Donc maintenant, je vais proclamer le prix. Hein, le, le grand vainqueur de la sélection ce soir, c'est Yasmine Alaouzi qui reçoit le prix du mémoire. spectaculaire par la qualité de la documentation, des photos, des dessins, des relevés, par l'intelligence de la réflexion, par le relevé, et en même temps un mémoire passionné qui croise des éléments biographiques et un mémoire de sociologie qui raconte énormément le, le vécu de ses familles dans ces fameuses maisons riffaines. Voilà, un mémoire qui cumule un certain nombre de qualités et qui a ravi le jury de par sa capacité à utiliser les outils de l'architecte pour mener une recherche qui aboutit effectivement à l'écriture et à la production d'un mémoire de très grande qualité. Bravo Merci. Je suis très contente, je me sens très émotionnelle, je vous raconte si c'est très bien, mais un tout grand merci à mon promoteur Bertrand Périnet. Merci énormément de m'avoir encouragé et euh, je tiens à remercier également toutes les personnes qui m'ont accueilli euh, chez elles parce que j'ai fait beaucoup de relevés, donc euh, beaucoup de, de travail dans le terrain, beaucoup de discussions qui, qui étaient euh, super enrichissantes et euh, enfin, je suis très contente. Merci à tout le monde. Félicitations, bravo, 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 et donc euh, félicitations au promoteur Bertrand Terry. Voilà, M. Doyen, Pablo Loas, le prix est proclamé. Merci. Je vais passer la parole maintenant à Marcel Rabinovic, qui est notre vice-doyenne et qui supervise un autre prix important dans la faculté, le prix du projet. Merci Eric. Alors, euh, voilà, vous savez que chaque année, depuis sept ans, nous nous confrontons au, à un jury extérieur les meilleurs projets de notre faculté. Cette année était exceptionnelle et je voudrais vraiment remercier tous les étudiants qui se sont engagés à participer à ce prix parce que je sais que pour eux, ce n'était vraiment pas évident. Et donc, je les remercie et je pense que le jury a apprécié tous les projets avec beaucoup, beaucoup d'intérêt. Alors, je ne sais pas. Non. 
Ah, ok. Voilà. Donc, en fait, vous voyez à l'écran les 14 projets que le jury présidé par Aurélie Haché, qui est à côté de moi et qui va proclamer les résultats. Euh, elle était accompagnée dans cette lourde tâche par Aloïse Beguin de l'Université de Liège et par Sarah Kremer qui représentait les BA1. Et Grégorio Carboni Maestri va gentiment faire le rapport de ce prix. Voilà, je vais céder la parole à Aurélie parce que je pense que c'est plus simple qu'elle nous fasse le compte rendu des résultats. Bonjour à tous. Voilà, je ne pense pas avoir la qualité d'animateur euh, qu'a pu avoir mon prédécesseur, mais euh, euh, j'en suis pas moins euh, contente de pouvoir euh, assumer cette tâche aujourd'hui. Euh, donc à mon tour, je voulais remercier tous les étudiants qui ont présenté euh, aujourd'hui. Donc la journée a été vraiment belle et intense, à l'image euh, vraiment de la dédication euh, qu'ils ont déjà pour, euh, pour l'architecture. Donc euh, on a choisi euh, donc pour le prix de la faculté le projet donc euh, ah, d'abord les mentions. <rire> donc euh, ah, c'est dans l'autre sens. Voilà. Ça va dans... Peut-être comme ça. Jouer alors. Ou bien avec ça, ou bien avec ça, normalement. Attends. Ça donne. Ok, on recommence. Ça a l'air un peu bloqué. Alors, on va recommencer. Tchouk, 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 tchouk. Est-ce que... Ouais, Allez-y, parce que le truc a l'air mort. Ah, ah, ah. Attends. Voilà. Si vous vouliez. Ouais, voilà. oh. voilà. <rire> J'étais trop loin, j'ai dévoilé une partie du <rire> En effet, l'animation est un peu chaotique. Euh, mais donc voilà, on voulait euh, donner cette mention euh, notamment à Isabelle Marshall. Euh, donc euh, pour vous qui allez rentrer dans la vie professionnelle, on voulait souligner par ces mentions euh, l'importance, euh, comme le disait, disait Georges Perec, de pouvoir euh, surtout lire un lieu, de pouvoir euh, le re-questionner pour ensuite pouvoir se l'approprier. Et on trouvait que justement dans toute sa démarche, dans cette façon qu'elle a eue de pouvoir lire des références, les réinterpréter pour les réinsérer dans, dans son projet, euh, son projet était, était exemplaire. Donc euh, Isabelle, je ne sais pas si... Donc, dans cette même attitude, une deuxième mention a été attribuée à Mirai. Mirai, je sais que tu es là. Voilà. Aujourd'hui, nous avons décidé d'accorder euh, finalement le prix de la faculté à Alice Paris. Donc, euh, Voilà, ben, félicitations. Donc, euh, si on a voulu te décerner ce prix, euh, c'est avant tout pour euh, ben, donc, la capacité et la maturité que tu as eu à pouvoir euh, déjà poser un sujet. Donc, le sujet est dans la question du sol, ou euh, comment tenir au sol, ou comment reconsidérer euh, le sol comme un vivant. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment euh, crucial aujourd'hui, une, une posture euh, qui est vraiment importante et que euh, pour le pour, pour autant, beaucoup d'architectes aujourd'hui peuvent le considérer encore un peu comme acquis. 
Donc, on a vraiment trouvé ça exemplaire. Et ensuite, euh, aussi, on voulait te féliciter pour euh, le caractère euh, expérimental euh, de ta démarche, donc à la fois euh, dans, dans ton approche, mais aussi euh, dans euh, euh, tous les moyens de représentation que tu as pu euh, utiliser et qui sortaient un petit peu des standards qu'on a pu voir, euh, voir aujourd'hui. Donc euh, voilà, félicitations. Merci, merci. Je crois que je vais d'ailleurs garder un masque vu les échanges de micro. Euh, alors est-ce que ça fonctionne Je ne vois pas. On va essayer de se dépêcher pour ne pas trop empiéter sur la conférence elle-même. Mais néanmoins, je ne voudrais pas passer à côté de ce que je vous disais tout à l'heure, à savoir de souligner en cette rentrée le départ de deux de nos enseignants. Guy Adam, Guy n'est pas là malheureusement ce soir, prof de construction bien connu et prof de projet, d'atelier de projet d'architecture, anthropologie et architecture. Euh, Peut-être qu'on peut, qu peut l'applaudir, je ne sais pas s'il est là sur le ou pas. À gauche, sur la photo de ceux qui ne connaissent pas. Et puis à droite, une autre euh, vraiment figure importante de notre faculté, Georges Pierson, Georges qui a fait énormément de choses pour la faculté, que ce soit dans ses enseignements, de la géométrie descriptive, au projet d'architecture, à la coordination de l'atelier de projet, qui s'est aussi investi dans des fonctions assez ingrates, mais néanmoins déterminantes pour la faculté et pour vous les étudiants, je veux dire par exemple la présidence d'un jury, et donc Georges, vraiment merci beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup. En plus, tu ne nous quittes pas tout à fait, mais euh, voilà, c'était l'occasion de te remercier et de saluer euh, tout ce que tu as fait pour notre magnifique faculté d'architecture. Merci Donc, outre ces remerciements à Georges, je voudrais quand même, euh, en cette rentrée, euh, profiter de cette occasion pour remercier tous nos collègues, quel que soit le corps auquel ils appartiennent, parce que figurez-vous qu'à l'UNIF, on parle encore de corps comme si on était à l'armée. Et donc, merci à tous de tout ce que vous entreprenez, et en particulier dans ces conditions difficiles, pour que euh, ces facultés fonctionnent. Et encore une fois, je le dis au bénéfice essentiellement euh, des étudiants. Si je dois qualifier cette rentrée 2020, ce n'est pas uniquement l'effet du Covid sur la nature de, enseignement, de nos enseignements que je dois évoquer, mais aussi l'accroissement un peu sidérant du nombre des étudiants. Plus 100 à partir de 180 pour la BAC 2 et plus 140, 150 sur 440 pour la BAC 1. On devrait se réjouir de ce que l'architecture, notre passion, intéresse de plus en plus de jeunes gens, mais malheureusement, dans le contexte du financement radicalement insuffisant de l'enseignement supérieur, nous devons plutôt voir cela comme une menace. Une menace pour notre enseignement, et peut-être, je ne veux pas dramatiser outrageusement, mais une menace aussi pour la profession. Cela m'amène non pas que je veuille faire un discours de politique facultaire à relever quelques faits saillants, me réjouir de la promotion, de la promotion que nous venons de proclamer à la Grand Place de Bruxelles de 172 diplômés qui sont docteurs ou euh, master en urbanisme, en aménagement du territoire, en management territorial ou en architecture, 145 pour l'architecture, relever le questionnement de notre collège des enseignants du projet d'architecture, que je remercie aussi vivement en prémisse à la prochaine réforme de cet enseignement. Souligner le développement du domaine de la formation continue. Espérer voir aboutir un projet interuniversitaire de formation avec l'ordre des architectes, une formation donc pour les stagiaires architectes. Finaliser la réforme de l'enseignement d'urbanisme, qui deviendrait à la fois un master 120 pour des bacheliers d'origine très diverse et aussi une spécialisation pour des architectes qui auraient fait cinq ans d'architecture pour devenir architecte urbaniste. Ouvrir le débat sur la finalité de l'enseignement d'architecture ou des finalités de l'architecture plutôt qu'une finalité. 
je pense qu'on est à un moment crucial où on doit se poser cette question, est-ce qu'on ne forme encore qu'un type d'architecte C'est aussi favoriser les collaborations, que ce soit avec l'Université de Mons, l'Université de Liège, la Haute École Charlemagne, dans la formation en architecture du paysage. C'est aussi cultiver nos partenariats internationaux, c'est consolider la recherche en et par l'architecture, recherche fondamentale et recherche appliquée, en continuant notre travail de conviction auprès des bailleurs de fonds de la recherche. Et développer encore, c'est peut-être une chose très particulièrement importante pour nous, notre rôle d'acteur culturel, que certains d'ailleurs nous, nous dénient, de rôle d'acteur culturel, et cette conférence de Kirsten l'illustre parfaitement, et notre mission, nos missions de service à la collectivité. Voici en quelques mots les enjeux qui traversent aujourd'hui notre faculté d'architecture. Je vous avoue que je suis particulièrement heureux aujourd'hui d'accueillir Kirsten Geertz, et ce, pour de nombreuses raisons assez variées. Il m'arrive de loin en loin de croiser Kirsten au détour d'un restaurant italien d'Avenue Les Roussards, d'un concours, pas assez souvent pour nous, d'une épicerie italienne de la rue Van der Kindere, et chaque fois de me dire, de nous dire que c'est assez dingue qu'il donne, qu donne cours aux États-Unis en Suisse et partout dans le monde, et pas dans cette faculté qui se trouve pourtant à 100 mètres littéralement de chez lui. Donc cette conférence est une première initiative de collaboration plus nourrie, j'espère, avec Kersten, et on en est donc particulièrement ravis. Présenter Kersten Gier, c'est sans doute un peu inutile, tant lui et son partenaire au sein du bureau d'architecture et de design office KGDVS, David Van Severen et leurs collaborateurs sont désormais connus et reconnus internationalement. Néanmoins, et je ne vais pas voler trop de temps, du temps de la parole de, de Kirsten, je voudrais aborder deux questions, enfin, ou deux petites euh, dimensions. La dimension d'office, de bureau. Et je me limiterai, vous allez voir, j'ai été un peu paresseux, mais je crois pour de bonnes raisons, à relever qu'ils existent depuis 2002 et animent quasiment depuis le début intensément la scène architecturale belge et internationale et qu'ils inspirent et questionnent de nombreux architectes et étudiants en architecture partout et ici. Pour les décrire en quelques peu de mots, j'ai trouvé que ce qu'ils disaient de ce qu'ils disaient d'eux-mêmes sur leur site internet était très pertinent. Je les cite Office est réputé pour son architecture idiosyncratique. C'est donc cette disposition à réagir de façon particulière aux agents extérieurs dans laquelle se côtoie réalisation et projets théoriques. Les projets sont directs, spatiaux et fermement ancrés dans la théorie architecturale. Ils réduisent l'architecture à son essence même et à sa forme la plus originale, un registre limité de règles euh, géométriques de base qui est utilisé pour créer un cadre dans lequel la vie se déploie dans toute sa complexité. Je trouve que ça décrit très bien leur position et leur croyance en architecture. Depuis sa création, il y a eu une des voies les plus originales dans le monde. Office s'attaque, c'est moi qui le cite, qui dit s'attaque à tout type de projet. Je pense que c'est aussi important. Conception d'architecture, d'urbanisme, de mobilier, d'architecture. Et donc, il ne répugne pas à s'attaquer à tout type de projet. Je pense que c'est aussi une qualité et ça rend sans doute le travail plus difficile et plus riche. Et d'autre part, à propos du titre de la conférence, « Architecture without content », qui sonne comme une provocation, une provocation en soi, et aussi peut-être parce que cela nous, cette provocation nous fait indéniablement penser à l'expo de 64 de Bernard Rudowski au Musée d'art moderne de New York, « Architecture without architects », et je préfère encore le sous-titre, « A short introduction to non-pedigreed architecture ». « Architecture without content » est le titre d'un livre dont Kirsten Geertz est co-auteur avec Yoris Kritis, Yelena Panchevac, Giovanni Pioven et Dries Rodé, Andrea Zanderigo, livre paru en 2015, dont l'éditeur Bedorf Press parle assez bien aussi. C'est pour ça que je dis je suis un peu paresseux, c'est que j'ai pris finalement des définitions assez immédiates, mais quand elles sont bien faites, pourquoi s'en priver Architecture Without Content est la première publication du travail de cinq ateliers conduits par Kirsten Geertz à Columbia, à Mendrisio, à Graz, à Lausanne. Partant d'une étude de, de Big Box, un grand bâtiment industriel qui pourrait contenir beaucoup de choses, le studio, les studios Architecture Without Content, développe l'idée d'une possible architecture du périmètre, une architecture pragmatique, 
pardon, qui reste radical et précise. L'architecture sans contenu est une architecture réduite à son périmètre même. Seule l'économie de l'enveloppe détermine le succès du bâtiment. Sa frugalité radicale ne le rend pas moins critique. L'économie de moyens est l'arme de choix pour exprimer son idéologie. L'architecture sans contenu est trop grande pour être ignorée. Toute chose aux accents très collassiens, qui témoigne de cette particulière qualité de Kersten de jouer avec finesse et intelligence de cette double, voire triple vocation d'architecte praticien, d'architecte enseignant et d'architecte théoricien, théorisant efficacement à partir de ces diverses dimensions et échelles de la discipline architecturale. Vous aurez donc compris pourquoi, au-delà d'autres proximités, nous avons souhaité que ce soit Kersten Guest qui ouvre notre année académique. Je laisse donc enfin la parole à Kersten, que je remercie très, très chaleureusement d'avoir accepté notre invitation. Merci beaucoup. Ça marche Oui, ça marche. Euh, merci Pablo. Je n'ai plus rien à ajouter, je pense. Je faire conférence. Merci. Euh, bah, la bonne chose, c'est que vous avez juste entendu tous euh, tout le, disons, le summary euh, en français. Et maintenant, je vais faire euh, la partie un peu plus longue en anglais, si ça vous va. Après, c'est vrai que je peux même parler en français, mais j'ai annoncé en avance que c'était en anglais. Donc, les, les quelques gens qui sont venus parce que c'était en anglais, je, je vais leur, leur servir. C'est normal. OK. J'enlève ça. Oh. Ah. So, well, very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Um, I have a bit of a long lecture, so in some strange way, there's about 380 slides. So I apologize. Um, I was thinking maybe to do kind of a world record 380 slides in one hour or something like that. Uh, maybe it works, maybe not. David, who is not here, is always with me in everything which I will present. It's very important. Um, I hope. Um, we are an office, we are many people, and I think it should also take this chance to thank everybody in our office who we on this. This is a picture from Rosa a few years ago. Next to me, everything, or everything architecture, because my process often the same. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, but I believe, since it has been announced, I will talk about this architecture without photo. Now, truth needs to be told, I often talk about architecture without content, and somehow in preparation to this lecture, I thought maybe I will also talk about something else. So, in a way, it's not the real title. The real title comes later, somewhere in 14 or something. Um, now, architecture without content, however, since we're in the school, and I was very happy to be part of this ceremony, Um, it's also, in a big respect, a project of education. So, in that sense, Architecture Without Content, and Pablo has been talking a little bit about that, um, it's ultimately a project of 33 booklets, which is finished now. Um, and these booklets, they are all students' work, so there's not anything which we made ourselves. Each of these booklets, somehow presents an approach to something which is important to us, which is important to our group of teachers, um, and which I think in one way or another became in some kind of dialogue important to our production. Now here you see a couple of pictures of these booklets. Ultimately, they are just a way of collecting. And I think it has always been important that we collected everything. So what you see in there, It's all the projects of all the years, all the studios which we've been doing. But also, I think it's a collection of a set of ideas. And I think Pablo just introduced a little bit. Um, I think there's a couple of ideas which I thought were important to share because ultimately they are fundamental to our thinking. So on the one hand, there's the idea of the big box. Now, the big box is something which came about in Columbia University uh, as an investigation of everything big. 
and everything uh, building which was essentially containing things we could not design. And in that regard, the big box came with concentration on making architecture where the content of the building is perhaps important in its sheer size, in its technicality, in everything, but which ultimately does not really influence the building proper, or at least the design of the building proper, because it can't. If I take the exa example of a data center, very often by the time you have finished the design of the building, the content and the technology of that data center. So we got very fascinated by this, that to a certain extent, currently in the States, but also in Europe, uh, among the biggest buildings built are buildings in which what they contain doesn't seem to any of our interest. But at the same time, ignoring this would be a mistake because it would actually giving up very important figures in the landscape. So here you see there are student projects. I think they're all beautiful. I think they're all the sides. I try to make this work, but it doesn't always seem to work. Okay. Um, and of course, there's sometimes also not student projects. I mean, it is made by students, but this is Centro Tori by Aldo Rossi. At the same time, the big box, I think, was a reflection about building in what we used to call the city and the countryside, but also building somewhere between these two ideas, or building in the realization that many of our built environments are essentially covered, but without much organization. You could say uh, there's been plenty of uh, teams, plenty of titles which have been developed to define this, whether it's the Blue Banana or the Diffuse City. We, uh, with our friends at San Rocco, we ended up calling it the even covered field. Now, the even covered field is nothing beautiful nor spectacular. It's in a way an argument about the reality is found, whether it's in the Veneto or, as you can see here in Flanders, but it could have been also here around Brussels. Um, ultimately, it's the understanding that despite our big, I would say, ambitions, we, we are forced to deal with places which are seldomly beautiful, which are seldomly spectacular, and that's okay. So here you see again a set of these. This is the AWC uh, 2019. This is uh, Strange Farm in Iowa. Um, these are what we call Roman architecture, but essentially sometimes analysis, sometimes proposals of buildings, uh, buildings put next to one another as false friends, uh, designs which all of a sudden uh, become comparable because you try to draw them again, because you try to, to look at them again, you try to, I would say, put measures, uh, understand scale. So with these ideas of trying to almost reenact a Roman idea of architecture and urbanism, an idea of territory, an idea of gesture, an idea of scale. I guess we came also to the problem of what the architectural project could be. So for us in the studios, this became the difficult hole. Again, the difficult hole, we did not invent this idea of a building. The difficult hole is essentially, uh, as I guess most of you, if not all of you know, uh, this thought, this idea developed by Venturi and Scott Brown in Complexity and Contradiction um, towards the end of the book, where they discuss the thought of a complex and for that reason difficult whole being potentially the only answer to, um, I would say, a context which you cannot control, an architecture which only refers to itself by means of what you could say, infliction. Now, with Yelena, with Andrea Zanderigo, uh, with Bas Prinsen, the photographer with whom we have been working uh, over many years, uh, we have then decided three years ago uh, to embark on this project of making this book called The Difficult Hole, um, somehow within the framework of all these studios, which was investigating exactly uh, these projects of Venturi, Scott Brown, I would say until the late 70s, which, to a certain extent, were projects you don't understand when you, when you would forget about learning from Las Vegas. So, in other words, when you would look at complexity contradiction of 
than to risk of drama. And you would try to understand to what extent this would be accounted as some kind of design theory. And here you have what kind of result Bas went with us and photographed some buildings like uh, the mother's house in Philadelphia, and it's very beautiful um, fire station. Now, the last element I would like to share with you uh, is the idea of the classic. So perhaps it's already vaguely present in the thought uh, of uh, Roman architecture. Uh, the classics somehow always uh, seem to be, uh, well, some kind of ghosts, even if you try to uh, reenact anything which you could call an ancestor, which is a term I did not mention, but which is very important in the whole uh, course idea, this set of projects, uh, these 33 issues of architecture without content. Towards the end of the series, we were explicitly busy with the classic, whether it was first through Ungers and through Ungers through Schinkel, or it was even, say, back to Bramante or back to the Sangalos. In some sense, the classic or the classics, classicists, but it's the hooking else, uh, the classic, I would say, uh, is something of a complex, I would say even more today, something of a complex object you would like to love or embrace, but in some sense, um, your, I would say, your approach towards it is always somehow problematic, is awkward. And in that regard, Trouble with Classicists, which is, of course, um, a famous title of this uh, song by Kale and Reed uh, on, uh, in Songs from Drella, which is uh, an album on Andy Warhol, uh, became our leading motive. So in that sense, not the classic, but perhaps the problem of Classicists, so what comes after the classic, but also to a certain extent condemnation about, we say, the the ambiguity, the dishonesty, perhaps the misunderstanding, which is often, I would say, at the base of the architecture project. So here um, we see a famous virtual icon by Alberti, uh, of which, I mean, it's not the only piece, but almost all of his architecture in Firenze at that time, in the 15th century, was essentially looking like that. It is very specific, black and white, you could say, uh, figures and graphics. Essentially, when he was making this architecture, he was trying to make something Roman, but he misunderstood the Magisterio, which is just there, as Roman architecture. So there the irony. So despite the fact that Alberti's Renaissance was, to a certain extent, based on a misunderstanding, it was powerful enough to survive and to become an architecture for, as reference uh, on its own. So I guess this ambiguity about the ancestor or about the classic, uh, we felt during all these uh, iterations of architecture without content became fundamental to us. Uh, so we were in this kind of neo peru um, uh, uh, like uh, kind of book of types, or whether it is uh, literally um, trying to redraw uh, Firenze like or uh, Firenze's uh, most important uh, uh, architectures in order to try to translate them outside of Firenze as contemporary schools in the full knowledge that as much as you can love these references, you cannot do anything even really similar to these because current Firenze, um, current uh, suburban context around Firenze forces you in thinking otherwise. So that kind of strange dialogue, that kind of um, I would say, in a way, failed, failed embrace that ambiguity, I believe, is, was important for us there. So, I test this set, I finish here with uh, a very bizarre uh, issue of architecture without content, I think it was number 27, which is, in a way, uh, you could say, uh, our uh, constructed monography of the Sangalo brothers. Uh, architecture practice. Uh, well, it's actually uh, two nephews and one, uh, well, uh, two brothers and one nephew, uh, Antonio, Antonio de and Giuliano Santal, uh, of which we claimed it was, to a certain extent, the very first contemporary practice. With this house, you could say, this gigantic palazzo for the King of Naples, which, which almost nothing is known, there's a plan 
And based on the plan, we decided with the students to complete the architecture to the point that you'd say, well, maybe it was like that. Pretty much like historians do, which we told their architects, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this in the most important way? At the same time, that's the same house with the more labels, I believe, is a beautiful bridge to what is the real topic of this lecture, which is a big house. I managed to get it here. Voila, so that's the real title. Voila, here the lecture starts, in fact. Um, so big house. I guess a big house is related to architecture without content in that it comes afterwards. Um, in some way, when we finished in December this idea, um, when we finished this odyssey, uh, and we started on a very new kind of trajectory, which is in fact called everything, but I will not show anything about this. Uh, I also think that slightly our interest shifted, but of course it's not true that all of a sudden everything is new. I think it's rather a different point, a different vantage point, a different perspective. So here Big House is, I would say, a lecture in which I want to collect a number of projects of our office, um, and each of these projects are dealing somehow with this problem of house, of course, to a certain extent with the idea of a big house. Um, I think house on itself has issues with, I would say, privacy, intimacy, and big house is maybe, maybe, uh, a thought of having a house bigger than other houses, with which I mean that um, maybe the big house is to a certain extent the idea of the public building of something collective to point in places which are not the city. So in a sense that uh, it might not make much sense to approach something in the field, something outside what we consider the core city and say I now I inject it with something crazy, public, representative. So, to a certain extent, the big house, I believe, is a reflection upon the thought that the big house has more thresholds than what we consider the public building has. It has uh, more to do, more in common with the house, but it is not really a house. So, for that reason, I mean, and quite randomly, well, it's not entirely random, you could say, I simply use the order of office numbers. I want to show you the projects which start dealing with house and then gradually, more or less, deal maybe with the big house. So, if one house is emblematic, maybe, of our own production, it's perhaps this one, so here on the left. Um, it's a house in um, uh, Buchenhout, which is in, well, in the outskirts of Brussels, you could say. It's in the damaged fields, but at the same time, Buchenhout is a proper village. It's a house which is made with two times nine rooms and a perimeter. I think the particular aspect of it is that the perimeter is uh, not coinciding with the site. And the other particularity is that all rooms have the same dimension. So I guess there, what was important for us is to try to see to what extent an idea of intimacy, which is extremely important to house, uh, can be translated on all levels, but without, I would say, holding back to the cliches uh, of the small versus the big. So here, to a certain extent, Every room has the same dimension, four by four meter. Um, the garden uh, is this rectangle, which is made by this, well, this uh, perimeter of metal uh, six. And together, uh, they make a place which seeks distance from the neighbors. Oh, well, sometimes hard to uh, Sorry, uh, distance from the neighbors but does not really fundamentally give up that place. So for us, it was important that the new, I would say, hedge 
of the terrain to a certain extent is read uh, as the figure, the rectangle which belongs to the house, which turns it essentially into a court house, two courts front and back. But at the same time, of course, uh, the distance created is something of which the status becomes ambiguous. Do we give it back? Do, does it still belong to us? Is it already part of the neighbors? You don't know. And I guess that sense of ambiguity between that what you clearly claim and that what you slightly give up became important to us. So that ambiguity also by being very strict in drawing lines, but ultimately understanding, and I believe Pablo was referring to that, that the way you actually use these figures, use these spaces, will rest always personal, ambiguous, private. So here you see that, you see the house below, which is, is made out of uh, yeah, cinder blocks, painted white, and the top, which is made out of wood. It's the same plan, but the wood has a different thickness from the cinder block walls, from the mineral walls, and so to a certain extent it feels very different. You can also see the house as a one floor house with wooden roof, because in a way the rest is roof material, and so, but the roof is turned into kind of a square, into kind of more blocky uh, volume. So here you see that, you see the two spaces, one below, one above. You see how simple the house is. You see that it does not take any single consequence out of specific uses of spaces. A bathroom is the same um, as a room, which is an either a living room or a bedroom, anything. The house is now already, I don't know, 12 years old, 14 years old, I don't know. The people still live there, their two daughters have grown up quite a bit, of course. I mean, they're teenagers, um, so they use the house differently, but they're still happy. So here you go, that's the house in the last picture. And I thought it was important to share this because I believe this negotiation of lines, of borders, of perimeters, of organizing kind of spaces, of thinking also about a kind of scale that fits all in some strange way, the size that fits all, sorry, uh, was important. This house is literally a house in, in many respects. It's perhaps the most evident big house in that it's big enough to be yeah. bigger than average. It's kind of house in so much that this building in Bahrain, um, well, we often call it Dar, now even that's slightly confusing, Dar is house, but Dar refers rather uh, to um, you saw it, huh? well, that thing there, <laughs> uh, the neighbor, I'll try it again. Oh, well, you know, well, the, the, the white rectangle is um, is what is commonly called the dar, but in fact is the measureless, is our project. Uh, the rectangle just on top with the patio is the real dar, is in a way an Arabic house. Now, what is this house for? Uh, the existing house has only been used by, um, say, a third generation post pearl fishermen, uh, it's to say people who have been um, fishing more than 50, 60 years ago for pearls. Um, this pearl fishing doesn't exist anymore, but while they were doing this, they were making this clapping music somehow on the boat because they were together for quite some weeks. And when they were on land, they, they stuck to doing this. They gathered together the whole boat, so to speak. They made this music. Uh, it became something of a tradition. Now, that tradition disconnected today from real pearl fishing was something of a small trace, something which is left in two, three buildings. So two, three dars, two, three, two, three houses, two, three very small spaces, as you can see, um, where uh, the Ministry of Culture had decided then uh, to try to maintain it as a kind of, uh, as kind of cultural manifestation. So in other words, uh, to, to buy these houses, restore these houses, keep the houses and keep them using it. Um, one of them was the one here you see on top. We got involved, we in a way restored that house, that dar. And they also asked us to extend it with a more public program, of which I think they initially thought we would add it to the building. 
but we thought that was a bad idea because if you want to keep such a private thing alive as making this music uh, in this small group of people, perhaps you would kill it by inserting a far more public program. So you could argue that next to that house, uh, that uh, we added a big house, uh, the tall one here below, which is the measureless, which is in a way based on this typology of a shared house to a certain extent. So not a set of rooms around the court, walled and almost inaccessible, but a set of rooms, one on top of the other, of which obviously the lowest one is the most public and a little bit more up, slightly less accessible, slightly more private. So here, literally a building which provides two, three extra, one, two, sorry, extra rooms uh, for um, visiting um, music groups, if I would call them that way, for musicians, uh, to stay because there's a similar kind of tradition, for example, Kuwait. Um, and then a place below, which could be opened and could be used in a way for far more public interaction. So here you see the first dar, the smallest one um, in its plan. So it's a set of columns uh, which carries its plates, rooms which are in between, which are completely wooden panels, uh, which are used. Uh, sometimes the lowest one to play this music. It's in a way a room of very similar that I mentioned than the initial one. And then two more. Uh, all the surfaces surround it. The columns are sometimes structural, sometimes are ducts. You see that? You see the collage of that? So the existing dark uh, on the left and then the, and the measureless, let's say, or the mirrored image, you see the same with the existing renovated building on the right. The second that we you asked to, to do, and in a way we did these two in parallel, and it's even true that the second one was finished first. That's also why often, and also tonight, you see these pictures, but the first one has been meanwhile finished as well, um, where the existing dar is not so interesting. It's a building from the 90s, but up there, hardly anything is really interesting. So we felt it was perhaps important also to keep that one and to clean it up in some way, and to build a similar building 10 meter high, like the first, uh, somehow negotiating with the maze of Mukhara, which is the area in which it's located. Same plans, section and plan. Um, here, the yeah, two perspectives. So, together, these buildings, I mean, the house and the, well, the big house, perhaps, um, make in our opinion, an interesting reflection upon how simple a project can work when it understands that it's a public house up to a point, but that it maintains its complex kind of character uh, in the outside. So here you see that these buildings are made in space, columns, they have this curtain like facade, and when an event happens uh, in the evening, for example, now here is just a to shoot to a certain extent, uh, this curtain is opened uh, and uh, the, the, the panels can open and it becomes part of the street. Let's see it here again. Here you see that inside this box, this box which is in between the columns, uh, allows in the lower part not perforated uh, um, the players of that music to even sit with the back against the wall. And in a way, that house type of space is just one, one big room for music. Here you see it open, you see the stair and the side spaces with the machines up, further up and more machines. Because in a way what it does is that um, the curtain allows us to have in the off seasons, I mean spring and winter, to have natural ventilation. It's very hot there in summer, 55 degrees or something. Uh, so then there is need, you can absolutely not solve it with the natural ventilation. There is a need for these uh, these, well, these echo machines. There's also need, of course, for a toilet and other things, and all these are put as objects in this leftover space between the column, the room, the box, uh, and the facade, say the curtain. And you see it's opening. There's a cat here somewhere. Voila. So, a big house. Now, this is really a big house, and I had my doubts whether I should add it because it's a bit silly, you know, it's just a big house. Now, fair enough. 
uh, as I said, it's a bit of a, I see these things also as attempts to, to think a little bit. I guess it's okay to have this house in the mix, this solo house, um, simply because in terms of thinking size and wondering whether size ultimately is important in this idea of this definition, I guess a solo house as weird and spectacular and exceptional to a certain extent as it is, um, I think for us ultimately, and I'll go through the slides quickly, don't worry. Um, for us ultimately, it's of course also about this amazing nature and what to do then, you can't do anything, true. It's of course also about this geometrical correction because we are obviously endlessly fascinated by this. Um, it's very much also about making a house which is almost nothing, which is not nothing more than a plate and a set of columns and machines which make the plate and the set of columns work. So in that sense, it's very related to what you just saw before. I think the Bahrain building and the solo house have that in common. The idea that you try to make visible the ambiguity of architecture, that you can somehow solve certain things. So this solo house is an autonomous house. So you can solve certain things, you're there, you have a certain minimum size idea of protection. Um, you're there with a few people together, so perhaps the only thing you really need to try to create is distance, so that when you're like with six people there, that you start to hate somebody after three days, that at least you can be far away from that person. So that's very practical in the solo house, you know, you can always run around and be on the other side. So there's this kind of strange idea of being alone, this kind of strange sense of privacy, because although it's enormous, in a way the spaces where you are inhabiting are very small or relatively small, and they're always far away from the other spaces, which we thought was interesting. But also, as I said, like at the Darsh, there's this uh, interest in how um, partly architecture is made by simple spatial devices, but also how partly architecture is made by technological devices, and how we have, I think, over the last 50, 60 years grown an ambiguity towards that. So, you know, say, call it the Pompidou effect in some sense, you know, uh, something which looks like a machine, but is not really a machine, which is, which is fascinating. And um, somehow seems to be a solution for the problem of technology. So, here you see that, this uh, circle segments, it's okay. The distance, as I say, uh, the objects on top, the beam which carries this, somehow makes it possible because, of course, the facade, as you just saw, I mean, it makes it square, so it's kind of illogical that the columns have to make the carry curve, so somehow the beam on top kind of mediates between the flat curve or the flat circle um, and, um, and the kind of columns which are in straight lines. Um, on the outside of the building, there's this um, weird uh, facades which are kind of um, stiff, but they work like a curtain, so you can move them open and you can uh, close and open them and somehow the segment can be really closed segment, but it can also be a totally open segment, you'll see other pictures. And then there's all these objects which you need to make it autonomous, these objects which make you survive, so the water container and the kind of temporary machine in case you have really a, a kind of a, a heat problem, let's say in the winter or anything, so they're all put on the top. And so they become almost like yeah, sculptures on the top, which represent uh, the kind of ambiguity of everyday uh, or kind of contemporary survival. So here you see that. So of course, details are important. I will not go too much into that, but you understand that if this detail is bad, the building would be bad. But luckily, the detail is good. Um, so um, so here, I mean, it's also an ambiguity about making a building which looks like a plate, but is in fact not really a plate because it even has floor heating and it has some insulation so that actually you can also use it. Um, and then this water tank, well, there's a few of these, about two. And you see this beam also contains all the ducts and the ducts go down. And then somehow, as opposed to the first house you saw, it's a house without walls. It's the opposite. It's a house which tries to say, is it possible when distance creates, in a way, intimacy, that you will get rid of all the walls and only have furniture? So that's what you see here. And you see the boxes are painted by Peter Vermeer, so the artist, very beautiful. Um, I see my crosses here. So now, to see. Oh, now the hand. Okay, big bad. Yeah. Um, so here you see that and here and here is inside outside so you're actually standing inside and you're looking outside but in fact it rather looks like the opposite um now as i said 
you can do a lecture about this house on its own, and that's sometimes interesting and maybe sometimes not. Um, I think here, uh, what I think it is about is really, it's the figure, of course. It's this negotiation between architecture as a spatial idea as an architecture as a technological idea. And I think it's also this idea of size. So, I mean, when size and all its possible, I would say, advantages um, come at play. So it's a very simple house. In a very strange way, the house, despite its particularity, is a relatively normal house to use. Now, if you go to normality, Perhaps this is the other side, the other side. This is absolutely extreme other side where the idea of collecting is not collecting two, three units around the kind of circular figure in negotiation with the landscape you cannot compete with, so you try to do as little as you can. But this is rather trying to see that collecting in some sense is also an idea of, of sharing. I mean, collecting literally, yeah, having something collective. So you see some machines on top, uh, it's a very much less machine like in the past than we saw before, but perhaps it much more embraces this box like aesthetic as you see here in these Louis Balls pictures. Um, it's a very simple building. It's a building of which I believe quite many architects would even think, why on earth would we even try to design these? Uh, it's a big box, but it's not even big enough to be completely big. You know, it's in a way a small big box. I mean, you know, it's kind of as far as we could get in the realm of big boxes. So try it small first and see if it comes in. So you see that here, you see a uh, Flemish city, suburban, British like tradition. Uh, there's some houses, some suburban houses. There's some boxes because they had one day decided to do an industrial site because it would bring, I guess, some tax money or something. Um, and then, okay, they tried to operate that site and then they somehow realized that in order to bring in, in that site, I would say, a more public element, it was maybe important uh, to, um, to develop an idea of um, a collective building, a startup center, uh, in French you say pépinière, uh, uh, essentially a place where people would enter, they would rent a place for one, three, something years. After that, they would have to move, maybe start their own building. But in a sense, it's almost like a service. And of course, it's also a bit of a tricky one. So you have to build a building which is endlessly changing uh, user. Uh, it has somehow a bizarre yeah, public aspect to it, a collective aspect. So in my view of tonight, I would say it's a big house, yes, it's a big house. It's a few people living together in kind of an understanding that they have to share a few things. Um, what do they have to share? I don't dare to use this pointer anymore, it's very strange, but uh, here on the right is a little triangle. They at least share, it's very small, it's kind of a shared meeting room because, I mean, they essentially they have a square room, we will see it uh, in a minute. Um, they have actually a kind of strange hidden parking lot, which is this in the back, and then they have this kind of triangle, which is a shared meeting room, so that in this time they're there, uh, they, can, you know, they can have people around uh, with who they meet uh, outside of their workshop. Because of course it's a kind of startup center, so it's in a way a set of boxes, small, very small big boxes, grouped together as a slightly bigger small big box somehow. Um, and um, anyway, it's also a building uh, understood as a simple shed. It's just one shed. Uh, it's a shed uh, facing the north. It has a big window, one half of the nine meter half, four and a half, as you see there. And then it kind of plays an idea with the idea of being kind of bigger than it is. Because as you saw on the plan a little bit, I guess the plan comes again soon. Um, it's, um, it has this kind of slightly twisted, twisted angle. So here you see the big, well, the small big room, which is the yeah, the atelier, the, what what these people then rent. Uh, we designed exactly that. The column, the column carries the building, a part of the two walls, uh, a little floor in there, a toilet, a space below, a space above, a big window. So to reduce the amount of light you use, important, um, and so to make it yeah, economical, ecological. Um, simple, pragmatic. So that's the building's plan. So four of these spaces, a triangular space there which has a shared meeting room. Since we desperately wanted the front to be nine meter high and the back four and a half in our kind of uh, uh, 
geometric obsession, you could say. We had to invent, and then somehow it became very interesting, this kind of outside parking space, because uh, the clients, right, it was a small competition though, uh, the clients absolutely at all costs wanted the, the back wall to be six meters high, so nine to six we didn't like, so nine to four and a half was okay. So in some strange way, it's this kind of strange clear geometry which allowed us to make parking uh, to the back door you see in the back by the cars are uh, where people who would actually rent this space could, could park their car. So here you see that, you see the back with the doors, the meeting room on the left, the front, the section. And actually, yeah, the building as it is, it's in a way uh, the very simple uh, stand with the column uh, of, uh, you imagine it could be, one where the stairs around one which is the back wall, and then the sticking out space where the cars park. And then these weird things you see in there on the left and the top, and in there on the, on the right and the bottom. The top one is totally necessary. It's actually a one meter uh, fire kind of uh, kind of protection uh, device. It's just a plate, which or it's an eye profile, which makes sure that you can make two different compartments. And by copying it in the back, it becomes in a way uh, the architecture. So here you see some details. You see the picture from the front, from the side with these yeah, kind of flags. Because the building also, since it's temporary, you use it, it remains collective. So you cannot have your big company name or anything. No, you have to say, I'm at the green flag, or I'm at the white flag, or black flag. I mean, well, so, so that's how it works. That's then the same color in the back, obviously. Um, and that's inside. So the houses, so we saw the houses, the neighbors in front. Wow, it's quite crazy. This is Belgium. Always the same. Um, uh, here. So this picture bus took just before it was finished. I think he took them all at the same time, but only with this one you see it. You see the paving is still not totally ready. But, but it shows, yeah, I mean, in the end, there's a million of things you have to decide. I mean, it's kind of glass, it's you know, greenhouse glass and so forth. You can do it because it's not, and so forth, and so forth. But again, here, since it's about big house, and I somehow thought it made sense, and I thought it made sense somehow also to, to stretch, to stretch the definition. I thought, well, let's share it tonight. So here, another of these buildings which I probably shouldn't share because it makes no sense, but it makes a bit of sense. And I think it tackles some of this, I would say, simple, pragmatic structure ideas, but on the other hand. So this is a house for the province in uh, Kortrijk. It's, um, it's a building which almost finished, really almost finished. I think it's, uh, it's finished in a month. Um, it's also a building which you could say it was always finished because it has always been there. It's a building where when we started doing it, the building was there, and since then the building has been there continuously. Uh, and we just have to be sure that it's still is going to be there for quite a while. And why do I say it's because it's a, it's a strange building, it's very simple. It's a rectangle building, you see here. The building was always there, it looked like this, I think. Uh, yeah, that's the building. Okay. Um, and as you can also see, I guess, um, it's quite obvious, it's been this typical exoskeleton building, concrete infill, I mean, it's a disaster, only cold bridges, you know, you can't use it anymore. Uh, so we were asked to do an analysis on its, uh, I would say, ecological performance, and well, that wasn't so difficult. I mean, it wasn't so great in terms of performance. And so, actually, we recommend it to, to demolish it, because we did an analysis, it was possible to transform it, and it was so expensive uh, that it made not much sense. But then somehow the story went like this, uh, um, the, let's say the, the permits or how do you call that, the kind of um, the area description and what you can and cannot do there has been well changed. So destroying this building would mean they couldn't keep their offices there, the province, uh, that they thought was a bad idea. So then in a way, the only way was to turn this building into say a passive building by keeping. Um, so, okay, um, we, we had a thought about this and we proposed in a way to take away from the building uh, all the external cores, 
Um, I think you can see that in the later plan, I'm not sure, I mean, I hope so. Yeah, here, to take the external cause away, you can see that here, to push the circulation inside of the building, to keep the structure, to clean up uh, the interior of the building, and to build a complete new building around it, which is only made out of ducts. So, the building you see is not, yeah, it's not really structural, it's that no column is there. Everything which looks like a column is a duct. Everything that looks like a plate is actually a screen. Um, and on top are the new machines which make this field with ventilated the whole building. So it's kind of a very, I'll say, old modernist building from the 1960s, which is hidden in a kind of Flintstones uh, architecture. Um, so here you see that. You see uh, the section of the building with the new building around it. And I think here you'll see a section through the duct. On the right, then the column which is the duct, and then the section, um, in a way, through the window uh, on the left. So here you see that these are pictures Bas took. So you you'll always recognize Bas's pictures that have a nice white frame around them. Um, uh, but he did that a few months ago. So you see how literally against the building is built a new building um, with these plates. Some of the holes are already taken out, the other ones not. Um, you see it here again. So building against the building, and here again, and here again. So these are these pictures by Bas, and then I thought I'd add a few pictures of the last weeks of the building now, but of course they don't have the same quality, but they should show you somehow how it develops. So there's this, see here, almost there, so you see the glass is in, and the glass goes as high uh, as the new building, so the way it makes the other building with other columns and everything, you can just see it. Um, you see these plates, which sometimes are about to be spaced, very rarely so, and then they have uh, glass uh, circles in them, but all the others are remain open and are like that. Um, and then here is inside, where you saw uh, the column you just saw here on the outside, you saw on Bas's picture, you see here on the inside, it has this uh, plate and the ventilation. And you see the old building, right, the white building here and there. You see the glass, which seems to not stop because it's taller than the existing, or sorry, than the old uh, floor. It's, uh, it follows the logic of the new building. Um, here you see that again, somehow. Here you see it with, yeah, well, they're installing the furniture. They were doing that yesterday. Um, as you can see, and some curtains. And somebody from our office, Anna, who is Check and you see it here again. So, I mean, I guess the reason why I thought it was not so stupid to put it behind the uh, solar house and maybe somehow in the slipstream of the Bahrain project is that it's building, which is ultimately, it presents itself to be building about structure, column plate. But it's not about that. It's a building about machines, which is in a way what Bahrain also is about, or Solo is also about. And at the same time, like the Barham big box, it's nothing more than trying to find the most pragmatic solution for, in a way, a very contemporary, almost non-architectural. I mean, there's no program here, right? I mean, I did not talk about what's in there. It's the province. I mean, in a weird way, it also doesn't matter what's in there. I mean, it's, actually, it's a very particular part of the province. It's a uh, um, people come there uh, when they have certain issues in the family. So, I mean, it's important, but we don't know whether that program will be forever there. So here, a project of which the program will probably not so quickly change, but it's certainly a big house. It's a 50 by 50 square. It's a square uh, plate, a table, uh, close to a standard. The square is tinted, you can see the roof, it's important. Like a natural uh, a still life. We developed together with Richard, we, Richard Pendlet, who actually developed the whole building. Um, the idea here was to try to understand what we do with buildings like this today, which are rare, meaning that they're one of the few, you could argue, public buildings we can still design as architects. So they're a new type to a certain extent. They're crematorium. 
Crematorium is, you know, very much, it's not the same, of course, it's a far more pragmatic version of a part of what the church also was. But it was not, it's not just that. I mean, it's also for a far wider group of people. And it tries to avoid, to a certain extent, specific representation. But it needs to deal with representation, which is a problem. So you have today a situation that this building has to represent something, has to represent a difficult moment, has to be important for you, has to be there to say, look, I'm not just a box uh, in the fields, uh, not look, I'm not a place where a very technical process happens, which is burning dead bodies, which is a very, in a way, dry, very technical affair, which is even run in a very dry, technical way by these people who run these buildings. But you have to provide these buildings with a certain identity, a certain dignity, civic dignity to a certain extent. But that dignity cannot be specific. So it has to work for everyone. So from that perspective, we try to develop this unity, which I think for a crematorium is far more explicit, stranger than the crematorium, at least crematoria, sorry, I've been visiting in the last years. Uh, it also tries to avoid this terrible collection of greys and browns and whatever you always see. Um, and it's this big plate, this nature mort, with these columns around it, which are in a way organizing um, a set of parallel spaces, which look at the landscape designed by Basman. Here you see that. And which you always approach here on this side, from the right, you approach it like that, you approach it frontally after you've been driving around in some way, you approach it, and then you have a sequence of spaces, and a sequence of spaces in which the spaces get higher over the length of the building. And also in a way more private, in the sense that you arrive, there's two family gathering rooms or friends gathering rooms at the top and the bottom here, and there's offices in front, people who not go to see. Then, if you go through this in a very thick wall, there's the two main spaces for the services. And I mean, the way it's these things is that the services often happen only with half an hour, 20 minutes difference. So there's a service on the left here below, and then there's one above. Almost at the same time, you walk in and you can walk out uh, immediately to the outside. You have already a lower part. Uh, and of course, these services are heavy and emotional, so you're in there. So you're still protected. You walk out, you take care, you get out. In both ways, and you, I mean, there's a couple of levels, a couple of levels of place there, uh, there's a family room, even more, so even behind the wall, in both cases. And then, when the building gets higher, still thick wall, and that's where the, the ovens are, and the machines are. But these are very high spaces. On the top there, where the ovens and the machines are, only a few people can go. Only a few people can follow, three, four people uh, close to the person can go there. That's, that's, that's the habit, that's how it works. Same time, the other spaces there below, on the very left, that's where machines are. Because, of course, this obsession with crematoria is that despite the fact it's a burning process, the idea of smoke is unthinkable. So you have to clean the air, clean the air, clean the air. So at the same time, people who still are buried uh, and buried after a um, church service, they will be brought uh, and dispersed, that is, these big cars, uh, in the back. And these cars they can drive in and drive out, but of course it's not something you want to see when you're in the service. So you have a kind of almost machine-like idea of the building from the left, and a very uh, process-like, um, very kind of subtle, a very uh, personal kind of experience one should try to organize uh, from the right. So here you see that section somehow of what I just explained. views, the model, pictures here by Stefano Graziani of the model. So you see it as, as the figure, the high and the low parts, the table tilted, the object on top, which are light objects, are in a way a hidden chimney object, also uh, are light holes, lines for water and stuff like that. The different, the parallel uh, spaces, yeah, the execution plans, and the same uh, sections, the seeds, Spaces, these uh, kind of strange dome, or semi dome, things on top. The perspectives we made together with Richard for the furniture and the piece, which here kind of uh, makes a kind of niche. Again, 
non-nominational, but of course of a certain weight. I believe you could only do this with Richard to get something kind of a form which is so specific yet somehow not engaging. And then these parallel models, as you see, always with the uh, infill, uh, with different, uh, it's actually kind of textile for sound, of course, absorption, and you have always these specific colors, and then the top light. Mm. Here, the highest space is where the, the, the ovens are, and then the other side, which is not in perspective, which is in the waiting sheet. Here you see the building now quite, quite close, in a sense. I think this was on the poster here. Um, this is a big plate, this is in parallel walls. They have early design pictures um, with uh, the holes, the walls, the light. The big plate in the back, which kind of protects the hearses a bit when they deliver uh, the dead corpse for this more technical cremation. See it here. Here the building, yeah, it's really a few weeks ago. I, I guess this building will be ready by the end of the year, if not January. Um, see back with the plate, with the pink doors. The whole facade, which is this corrugated steel, which uh, looks like this on the outside. And I think if you go in, looks like that on the inside, you think there's not the same. But I tell you, it's the same there. Here, see um, the doors, the light. And the furniture, and Richard Vennett on the right, huh? and Anna. Mm. So, so this is a mock-up, of course. I mean, it's a longer piece, but uh, maybe for that I wanted to show it because you know it's this kind of strange intimacy, this kind of bizarre desire to design everything, to be very specific, but to know that also this is a shared space, and this need change. You wish not to have to come there very often. But it doesn't mean that you do not have to give it uh, that attention. Now, perhaps the big house or the big house in the most evident uh, kind of uh, logic or relevant interpretation is this. It's a project in Paris. We just finished. It's not yet photographed at all, so I'm using other photographs. Um, it's a big social house. It's a housing complex in Paris um, called Casernerie. It's really Paris, meaning for us it's very important that in Paris, we try to understand how you've been there in some strange way. You do not try to uh, make a crazy object, which is a kind of a test of your own insanity, but rather try to, in a master plan of H2O architects, we got here and they just have this, this site on the side here, um, which is kind of a of this whole densification of the whole desert, which is these three buildings, one, two, three, you see. Uh, in an attempt to turn it much more into an urban piece, but also, and I think that was an important correction, which we made very soon into, into the, to the project, to, to keep these figures, these three buildings, in what they were. I think the initial master plan suggested to build against these buildings, so around our area, we proposed to cut the buildings loose, and make this kind of strange, kind of, I would say, composition of proximity, where all the buildings which we would add would be as close to the to the to the existing uh, um, wing of the of the caserne, which, by the way, also was turned into housing, um, as so as to make a kind of a set of intimate spaces, but that with an extremely reduced vocabulary. So, what is this vocabulary? Here you see, I think. Yeah, we see the collage as we did. So we propose to make these buildings um, all in the main three choices. One choice of window, which is a 240 by 240 window, which is enormous in some sense. For social housing, we thought, uh, I mean, as I guess most of you know, in, in France, social housing is so regulated with T1, T2, T3 systems. So, okay, the plans will be okay, but they will never be amazing. Um, so again, here, uh, the idea was, can we design a window which is so good, which has this so sunscreen included, uh, which which works on the detail level, which is as flat as we can in the facade. So as to make the So you see that the different buildings in their different proportions become very different with the same window size because of course there's sometimes more and sometimes less space in between them. Um, we added a set of windows 
always in between in the existing building, and then together they make this uh, urban cluster. So here you see that um, in the way the existing building, uh, two, uh, one, two, three, two ones, and actually these three, three squares, you see there are artist studios which also belong to our project. Um, so here are the pictures um, of the project as it is. Um, it's, it's kind of finished. I mean, these pictures are uh, with confinement, it's hard to get past there, but you can understand that uh, you give an idea. And what for us was very important is to um, to bring in this plinth. You see, uh, for the rest, it's very simple plaster. This plinth, you somehow relate to the plinth of existing building. Um, there's this big windows, being to become also here uh, in, the, in the corners, uh, the main entrance halls. So you see that? Here, you see another of these here, here again. And actually the other one is here around the corner. And here you see the entrance halls where these big glass face, you have no division anymore. That's where the entrance halls are here. And here with work uh, by um, uh, Gregory Miguel and Daniel de Waal, uh, who, um, who turned into two special places. I mean, it seems like I'm not at all following my own idea of being faster, faster. So, the very big building exists. It's also a house in some sense that it um, tries to deal with the problem of suburbia, which is surrounding it. Um, it tries to deal also with the problem of the big and the small. It's four big boxes trying to organize a very big working plate. It's the RTS. In Lausanne, you see it here, you see models in that sense very beautifully telling. You have the buildings of campus, if you have the name, you have all these small houses, you have the learning center, and have this problem of negotiation and how you can make some kind of place in this. It took six years to do it. I mean, to do it in the sense that to get to the point where we can actually say, and these are the construction plans that are actually building. Um, but now we are. Um, and of course, if I would have more time, I would explain you much more about this. But that doesn't matter. I mean, I think it tells the story of how a building, uh, again, which I, I hope you understand, and also uh, this idea of, and I think that you can see in the also, this is four buildings, and they are so simple, they have a very similar idea of the style of the one that the Paris House have been talking about. It's even in, say, Storm Milano plaster, has the same windows. And then they carry uh, this plate, which perhaps in every regard wants to be exceptional. So that's what you see here inside. That's the space. I mean, these are, well, you know, we like to make collages. These were renders which were made when the building started construction because the clients wanted absolutely to understand how it would look like. Um, so here, this is the construction site. and makes a bridge into a house. Not so much that it's really a house, but what we liked about this is this bridge, as you see, is not so much a connection from A to B, but a court literally squeezed between the parliament, Belgian parliament, and the kind of set of meeting rooms in the meeting room building on the other side. Um, you see that here? It tries to solve a high difference by stretching the line so that it makes it possible for a, a wheelchair uh, to simply go uh, to take the height difference without having to do other devices. So in a sense, a very pragmatic idea of length made the circle. At the same time, you're of course interested in making a bridge into a place. I mean, I'm not saying a place is a house, but the thought that you can turn a bridge into a place to stay rather than a very quick connection, something to pass. Here you see some pictures by Bas of the structure during construction. And here you see the numerous pictures which I just got this morning, um, which were taken by A+. I don't know who took them, in fact, um, of the building as it is now. So you see, you don't see it, it's here on the right. And here it is. I don't know if you can see it. Across, across the shoulder. Uh, here. Mm. Mm. Or here. This circle, this space, 
and I'm really kind of close to the end, kind of close to the end. Um, um, brings us to this idea of a space with a court as perhaps the ultimate idea of a big house. You know, a place which is not all to be public in as much that it makes a gigantic gesture, like that bridge, I could have said that. The bridge, you can only see inside when you're under it. You can't see anything otherwise. I think that's a kind of idea of engaging with the public which we really start to like. And that's where I wanted to go to. So here we go to that. This is a library, a library in St. Martin's Latin, competition we won, we now will soon start building like um, It's a very simple figure, it's a circle. It has a court, as you can see. Mm. Here you see it again, as a court. It has a square inside somehow, but then there's a quarter circle cut out, which is a set of, uh, is, is a space, which is either a shared space for the school, as it is a place where the kids eat or for their lunch, or it is an event space for that library, because the only way to make this library possible, that you combine, as a difficult hole, you could say, um, all around this court, here you see that. Here you see the building of the library next to the school for which it provides a set of classrooms and which are on the top actually, I didn't explain that, and this kind of quarter space, which is a shared space. See it again. And it's a library which despite the fact it's probably good, there's only one big window here door. And then it's the beginning of a set of windows which only go to the back. You see that here is the window the door, the entrance, all the rest is closed, there's a court, bathroom, and then there's a set of openings which turn towards the screen. This is inside, so the building is in a way just a gigantic bookshelf which carries the roof uh, around the, the, the patio. Here you see some pictures of Stefano of the model. So you see the entrance door here in front of us and then a set of windows turning towards the school. These are the windows towards the school. Here are the, this is the front facade, nothing. So this is the library, these are the plans. Voila. So towards the end, the house becomes a public building and yet it of course not really. It's a gallery, a gallery which is a set of rooms, one next to the other. It's a gallery which always tells out before it opens, strangely enough. So it becomes like a small museum in a part of the city of Antwerp, Antwerp South, where essentially there's currently nothing. It's the only same public space. Hence, I thought it's so close to this weird idea of this big house. It's in a way a place owned by Tim van Laar, it's Tim van Laar Gallery. It's his house to a certain extent. It's a storage. Is a set of drawers um, with uh, uh, images and uh, it doesn't really work separately there all the time. Two real exposition spaces and a court. It's in the middle of this big development, all made out of uh, prefab elements. So we thought it was extremely important to make something which is made in situ to give it a different idea, like a whale, like an object which is stranded. Something completely other from the other buildings, from this, in a way, typical housing mechano. It's a house with the central windows to each of these rooms, which are white on the outside, but they're open, and so on the inside when they're closed, but pink on the outside when they're closed. It's also a space uh, with uh, wooden beams and sheds on top. You see them here uh, for, for beautiful light. But it remains in many ways a house with a storage, with the front space, with an entrance space, the working space, with the private space, with all this, with the, even with the terrace. This also shows this reflection of architecture that when it tries to get rid of so many things, it's also almost nothing anymore. So this is an olive oil kind of pressing place in Tuscany, close to Firenze. In a way, the simple is very simple. It's a kind of a square space in which there are olive oil presses. It has a circular roof. The circular roof that follows the, the slope. It's made out of concrete mixed with, well, 
local, I would say, what is it called? It's kind of um, argile type of thing. Um, it's a place which is made to press the olives, which are all planted as olive trees. And when they plant the trees, what happens is that many stones, many pieces of stone are there, and they don't know what to do with them. So we proposed to make it a big table, in a sense, where all they move, they put all these stones. So you see them here, all these pieces, which are simply gathered uh, when the plant trees are part of the building. The building is just a concrete plate on a corrugated concrete square. It's nothing more than that. Looks a bit like a moon there. The people who made this, this, this thing, I mean, it's competition we won, they are kind of obsessed by biodynamic kind of uh, olive pressing, let's say. So somehow they were fascinated by this moon shape. I must say we didn't even realize. But okay, the fact that it has this bizarre idea of representation, that it shows something we didn't really know. I find it ultimately really said that you you have this figure, totally abstract, very simple, box-like, but evocative. Now this idea of evocation of thinking of representing something, embracing representing something, almost venturiesque, if I can say, but at the same time restraining from it, refraining from it, saying, look, we show, but we don't show, is perhaps, and maybe here I can finish, the most present in this current project for the beer project um, here in, uh, in Brussels, the Belgian beer project brewery, the competition we won some years ago, which we will start building now very soon. We have a contract here. Very simple, baby. big box. It's a losange shape, as you saw somehow, has a pitched roof. It's very tall, you see that here, right? You see person. It's really tall. I don't know. I don't know how tall it is. 15 meters. Stop. It has only these vats. Which are not, of course, like we see in the wheels, these amazing vats. No, it's a very simple industrial vats, but they're beautiful too. There is metallic vats. They're all assembled there. That's how they brew beer. They're all below that roof, which is this pitched roof, which, well, I should go back one second, which makes a kind of beer garden or a special shared space on that side on the left here. And in a way, it becomes the, the figure of the building everywhere else. It's almost like a tent. For us, it's a building, the zanzu shape, as I said, with tables inside, with a tent like room, the tables, tables with all these devices, the tent like roof, the tent like roof. Almost like these tents you see on the shinkle pavilions, you know, these kind of figures with the stripy tents. And of course, I guess this beer project has all these strange beers with strange colors. And rather than representing a few beers, we just took some of these colors and some others and we make our own color code in some sense. So it represents the beer project, but it also doesn't represent the beer project. It also represents Shinko. It also represents the tent. It, it deals with these stones, these ideas of making the most industrial buildings also the most light uh, of the mall. You see that? See this? This is actually the model. See from the big doors we find to look out. Now in the final version, which I think is better, is really the building as it will be built. Um, this yeah, stripy tent like roof, these big vats, the tables on these stands. On the side, and again, and again. And only with these pictures of Bas Vincent's uh, model for the living and black finish, maybe only because it shows the ambiguity of representation. So it's a model of a pavilion that comes with these very, very small pictures of Bruegel's um, um, Tower of Babel, of course, um, enlarged to the point that they start to compete with nature. Architecture, at the same time, it's most present and it's most absent. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. C'est le son d'architecture. Euh...
à la fois pragmatique, profonde. Merci d'avoir partagé tous les doutes et tous les, les richesses et les paradoxes qui vous traversent. Merci beaucoup. Malheureusement, nous n'aurons pas le temps pour des questions, mais peut-être qu'on pourra prendre rendez-vous pour une autre, Bien sûr. pour une suite à cette magnifique leçon d'architecture et qui tombait vraiment à pic pour célébrer cette nouvelle rentrée académique 2020. Merci mille fois, Kirsten, et merci à vous d'avoir été là. Merci beaucoup.